Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship you in song. And now as we turn our attention to your words and the, and the teaching of Jesus, I pray that you might help us, Lord, with all of our maladies and injuries and that you'd help us to, to view your word as you put it and as you meant it, that we might accept it and live in it. And Lord, as we're educated in our minds, I pray that you might cause our hearts to be sensitive to the things, Lord, that you'd have us to do. I thank you for everybody that's here for the privilege of meeting in the name of your son, Jesus. And I pray that you help us to enjoy it as long as we can. In Jesus' name, amen. So this week, I had, uh, I had contemplated doing a Mother's Day service. And then I realized that all the men would be like. <laughs> and if I do a Father's Day service, all the women will be like. So I decided to roll forward into the book of Mark. I hope that's okay. And it just so happens we're talking about marriage and divorce, according to the Bible. Now, marriage and divorce is one of those things that... Uh, it's kind of like the, the greatest joy of most people is looking forward to their wedding and marrying and meeting the right person. And it's much more exciting when you're single. Yeah, you guys don't have any sense of humor today. Okay. See, humor is one of those things that helps to diffuse a sensitive topic. So... Uh, yeah, looking forward to being married is something you should do when you're single. Mm -hmm. That was my point. Oh my I, I didn't pray for help this morning. That was my fault. <laughs> Our society views marriage as a convenience, as a secular thing, as a social thing. It's a construct of man, and it's not. It was created by God, and it only works a certain way. Just like you don't take a Porsche off-road, you can't treat marriage cavalier and do what the world tells you is okay for a marriage, because it's not really a marriage. It might be a social contract, but it's not marriage. Marriage, in the truest term, as God has intended, it needs to be observed the way God intended it. And the reason that we're now upwards around 50% of all marriages end in divorce is because nobody wants to put the work in to make the thing work because there's nothing binding like a covenant before God. Before 1947, and I forget the exact time, only 10% of marriages ended in divorce. 10 in America, in, in this country. By the time 1947 rolled around, it was 25%. And now we're up over 50% of all marriages end in divorce. And there's a ton of people, younger people, who don't even think that marriage is an option. So they'll just live together forever and hope that the other one doesn't die and leave them without a will and all sorts of other strange things that happen when you don't have that. So marriage and divorce, it's, it's a big topic. And, you know, when you talk about making a wedding, by the way, there's a wedding on July 6th. July 6th is also the day we're having a picnic. July 6th, we're going to have a wedding before the picnic. Peter Dragna and Carolyn McTurnan will be getting married at our picnic. See, I told you people are excited about the wedding part. <laughs> it's the divorce part that everyone has trouble on. It's one of the most devastating things that can happen to a person in their life. And I realize that some of you are divorced and may be divorced more than once. And so this is going to dig up a bunch of stuff. And I, I will apologize for your hurt feelings, but I'm going to tell you exactly what Jesus said because I think it's important that we submit our lives to him. And if we've made mistakes, we made mistakes. And we deal with that and take ownership of it. I can tell you being married for 40 years has not been easy for me. 
and it's been less easy for my wife. Um, but the Lord has used her as a tool in my life and made me a bit more balanced. Believe it or not, I was much more reckless than I am now. So the, the key verse that we have today is Mark 10, verses 7 to 9. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. These are the words of Jesus. Now, there are churches and there are other people who would change what Jesus teaches and add to what the scripture teaches. Uh, we, we have words for them, and uh, you, you can fill in the blanks with that. But this is not, this is what God has said, and so we're going to observe it the way he said. Just to remind you of what we went over last week. Remember, we were talking about Jesus explaining greatness. It's not the way that we look at greatness. And Jesus then laid out a number of things for greatness. To be great, you must be last in order so that you can be great. So if you're going to be great, that means you're the last. That means you wait to the end. That means you're not the first. It means you don't claw your way to the top and trample over people like some people have an idea of greatness. It means that you're in the lowest rank. You consider yourself the lowest person in the room, which means you have an obligation to serve everybody. Jesus said, if you want to be great, you have to be the servant of a few. No, most. No, you have to be a servant of the nice. No, he said you have to be a servant of all. Just so you understand all the exclusionary things that a lawyer might put in there aren't in there. Number three, you look out for the least. You care about the orphan, the widow, the unborn. You care about those who are weak and don't have a voice. You care about little children. You care about those who have needs. And you look to those things and you take them upon yourself. You know, the, a pyramid usually has the point on the top. And, you know, corporate structure and all, you can look at that and, you know, you've got all of your people on the bottom rung and then the middle management rung. And then you have the boss, the CEO at the very top. The way Jesus does is he turns it completely around and he says the person that's at the top is on the bottom and should support everyone that's above, which is a very different way than what we have in our world today. So Jesus teaches this. You look out for the least. You're inclusive and not exclusive. Remember, the disciples said, we, we saw some people casting out demons, and we told them because they don't follow us, they should cut it out. I jerseyfied it a little. And Jesus said, don't do that, because there's nobody who in my name will be casting out demons that soon will turn their back on me. And it's interesting, because that's what the disciples did. And they weren't able to cast out demons earlier, if you remember. They tried, there were seven of them left at the, the foot uh, or, or, yeah, no. The ones who were left at the bottom as Peter, James, and John went up on the hill, the nine of them, they couldn't cast the demons out. And so I guess maybe they were a little jealous. If you want to be great, you serve small in small ways. It doesn't have to be great. You don't have to necessarily become a monk and meditate on your navel somewhere. It's done in small things like even a cup of water in the name of Jesus in relieving somebody that Jesus said that there'll be a reward for. You're sensitive not to stumble people if you're a great person. You don't just say, well, this is the way it is and I'm not making any apologies. Well, that's just the way I am. I rub people the wrong way and that's it. No, you don't do that. If you're a great person, you're sensitive to the needs around you. You kind of read the room. You know who you're dealing with and you know what the sensitive issues are and you're careful not to just impose on people. Does that make sense? Okay. I know this is all, you all have this memorized, but <laughs> radical removal means that if you're great, you're always in the process of shedding things in your life that don't belong there. Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it from you. It's better into, enter into life with one hand than it is to enter into hell with all your members. He said the same of the eye. He said the same of your foot. And he mentioned a place called hell three times. He's quoting one of the Psalms where the worm doesn't die and the flame is not quenched. It's an eternal place of torment that we all deserve, but Jesus has rescued us from. Amen. 
that we should be seasoned with salt and we would be a sacrifice for others. This is, these are all traits of greatness or maturity in a Christian's life and it's something that should characterize our lives. So this week, we're going to go over marriage and divorce. These are the 12 verses we're going to cover today, beginning in verse 1, if you read along with me. Then he arose from there, and he came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. And so he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. It was quiet that day in the congregation. <laughs> it's very serious business. That's why when you get married, you want to do it right, right? Yeah. You want to meet the right person. You want to keep your commitments and your covenants before God. Well, beginning in verse 1, he says, And he arose from there, and he came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him again, as he was accustomed, and he taught them again. So Jesus, wherever he goes, there are crowds that come around, some of them looking for the activity of his miracles, uh, some of them looking for an opportunity for a free meal, because Jesus has been known to feed people with very little food. Some of them come to hear his teaching, and some of them come to assault him, actually, and trap him in his words. It's a lot like Sunday. I was just kidding. <laughs> And so they came to Jesus, and as he was accustomed, he taught them. By the way, he is on his way toward Jerusalem. This is towards the end of his ministry, and he's heading toward the cross. He's already told his disciples twice that he's going to be delivered over to the Gentiles, to the Romans, and he'll be crucified, and he'll die, but he'll rise on the third day. And they had no clue what in the world he was talking about. He even told them as he came down from the transfiguration, what you saw, don't say anything until I rise from the dead. And they didn't know what he was talking about. So you get the idea that disciples are a little thick, just like us. So this is where he is. He's over just below the Decapolis area over in Perea, which is on this side of the Jordan. He's on his way crossing over to go to Jerusalem. Uh, the next place they're going to go is Jericho right here. So he's, he's over here on the shore and traveling on his way. Now, you don't appreciate how much, how much, how many miles, kilometers, wherever you're from, they have to travel to get to these places. It takes time to be able to traverse. You might be able to do 25 miles in a day if you're walking and you're carrying, you know, belongings and, uh, you know, food. And if you're hiking, my goodness, you know how hard it is to hike long distances. These guys did it on a pretty regular basis. Their feet were probably like leather. But Jesus, as he was accustomed, taught the people. So wherever he went, he was always teaching. Do you know that wherever you go, you're teaching? Whatever it is that you approve of, whatever it is that you say, whatever it is that you do, whatever it is you don't do, you're always teaching people by what you do. Right? And I remember having children, and I was surprised to remember that my kids were in the back seat hearing every word of my conversation with my wife. And I was like, ooh. Like, you see, you see these little kids that pick up words they like to shock mommy and daddy with? You know, vulgar words. And then strangers go, gee, 
wonder where they got that from. <laughs> it's because wherever you're going, you're always teaching, and there are some people that are more sponge-like than others. And so I try to be mindful of that. Jesus, wherever he went, as was his custom, he always just continually was teaching wherever he was going. And of course, his disciples were closest to him, but then there was the whole crowd that was following after. And the Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. Notice uh, Peter dictating basically to Mark this passage says they came to pick a fight. They came to test Jesus. And they did this very often. They, you know, should we pay taxes to Caesar, Jesus? Well, if he says yes, all the Jews would be mad at him. If he says, if he says yes, you should pay your taxes, the Jews are unhappy or the, the, the Romans would be happy. And if he said uh, you don't need to pay taxes, it's going to be a, a riot and uh, Rome's going to crack down on him. So they've tried these tricky questions. You know, it's, it's one of those tricky questions where you, you can't give a right answer if you look at it on the surface. But Jesus is very sharp about the way he answers things. And so they're going to ask, can, can, a, can a woman, can a man, notice it, it's not about a woman divorcing, it's about a man divorcing. And these are men asking him. So you, you wonder if things aren't going so well at home and they're looking for Jesus to put the stamp of approval on their decision. In Matthew 19, 3, it says, the Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? So you get the idea that there was, there was another way that the question was asked that maybe Peter just got to the, the root of it because it's, it's, it's Mark after all and you don't get all the details. But here, for any reason, you know, there are people that believe you should be able to get divorced for just about any reason, right? I feel like I'm talking to a room full of people that never heard this before. <laughs> At the time when Jesus was here, there were two rabbis. There was Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shemei. Shemei was a conservative, and he believed that the only reason for divorce, according to the scriptures, was sexual immorality. And then Hillel, he basically said, you could get divorced for any reason. And the Pharisees, who enjoyed arguing, they just enjoyed getting together and having a good old knockdown, drag out argument, decided to have an argument about this. And I wonder if they're trying to include Jesus. And so it's a little rock'em sock'em robots between my opinion and your opinion. And <laughs> under the thinking of Hallel, a man could divorce his wife if she spoiled his dinner, if she spun. Or went with unbound hair, if you didn't have your hair all tight up and covered. Or spoke to men in the streets, like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking for directions. That's it, you're done. <laughs> or if she spoke disrespectfully of his parents in his presence. This is all written down, guys. Or if she was a brawling woman whose voice could be heard at the next house. <laughs> Given to raising her voice. If you yell, that's it, you're out. These, this is actually written down. <laughs> Rabbi Akaba even went to the length of saying that a man could divorce his wife if he found a woman whom he liked better and considered more beautiful. <laughs> By the way, this is not Biblical. This is, what, this is what men spin when they want to make the word of God say what they want it to say. But we don't do that here, do we? We look at the scripture and we take it at face value as to what it says. But just so that you understand, there's a bit of history behind this question coming and trying to trap Jesus. In Matthew 5, 31 and to 32, Jesus says this, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So Jesus makes it very clear whose side he's on or whose side Hillel is on really. 
Perhaps he was trying to trap him. The Pharisees were trying to trap him into disclosing his position on marriage because if you remember, Herod had a problem with John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, that woman that you're married to, you're unrightfully married to her because she used to be your brother's wife. And because of his views on marriage, he really ticked off Herod's wife, his new wife, which is really his sister-in-law, become his wife. It gets confusing. And so she had her daughter go out there, which is his niece, to dance a seductive dance. Her name was Salome. And got him all sweaty and bothered. And he said, listen, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. You jerk. And she said, give me, the John of, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter, on a silver platter. Very specific, because her mom told her what to do. And so perhaps this trap was to try to get Jesus in trouble with the Romans and get him to disclose his position on marriage. And then they would just go and be tattletales back to Herod and say, Jesus said, you, go, you should go get him. So perhaps the Pharisees were trying to disclose his view on marriage and divorce and then report it to Herod Antipas. Uh, Herod is a position, by the way. Antipas was the guy's name, in case you didn't know that, because there's a lot of Herods. And if you look at how long the Herods reigned, it seemed like forever. It wasn't just one guy. It was a bunch. And verse 3, and Jesus, he answered and said to them, well, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. It's interesting. The Bible has all kinds of things to say about marriage, but they remember this one thing. Oh, Moses said, actually, he gave a command that we should divorce our wives. If you look in Matthew, that's the way it's put there in chapter 19. He didn't command you should divorce your wife. He didn't do anything of the sort. And the only thing they remember is like the 1% exception. You know, there are people that are professionals at loopholes. We call them lawyers. <laughs> They're professionals at you getting out of the law, you see? And that's what these guys do. They're, they're very exclusionary. So they have this exceptional theology, which is there's an exception. Yeah, but 99% of the Bible says this. Yeah, but there's this 1%. Or less than 1%. Okay, whatever. So, some clarification is needed. They're pointing back to Deuteronomy 24, and I figured I'd take you there from verses 1 to 4. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness. Now, there's the point at which people try to define in her. And he writes a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. Then, when she is departed from the house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if a latter husband dies who took her as a wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin on the land in which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. How many of you, it's the first time you've read this in Deuteronomy? First time. You've all read this. Okay, first time. Oh, first time for a couple people. Good. Does this sound like Moses is saying, you should get a divorce, or he's saying when you get a divorce, this is what you shouldn't do. He's not authorizing divorce. He's saying, you guys are in the habit of doing this, but make sure there's a piece of paper so that this woman's reputation is preserved and there's some kind of a legal document. In fact, when we get married today, we actually have to fill out paperwork and register with the state so that they understand. And they'll do a background check, make sure you have no other marriages because polygamy in the United States is still illegal. Um, if you get married in Arabia, it's commonplace. But I digress. This is the process that protects a woman's rights and reputation so that you don't just kick her out and send her away with a certificate and then she goes to this other guy, he kicks her out and she shows up at your door and says, hey, could I be married to you now? 
They don't have a place to live. And people don't have anything. If you're a female and you go into a man's property and into his home, you get kicked out with nothing. It's not like the courts today where you get 50% of whatever's going on and, you know, you can, you, can, you can live fat and happy and not have to do anything. That would be lovely. But back then, you got nothing and you left on your own. And so this woman would then be looking for a place to live. She would be looking for security. If her parents weren't available, she'd have nowhere to go. She'd end up on the street. So there's, there needs to be a process so that this woman's reputation and also the propriety of marriage is preserved. And so that's what this passage is about. It's not about being okay to get a divorce. Deuteronomy 22, 13 to 14 clarifies a little bit. It says, if any man takes a wife and he goes into her, I don't have to elaborate, right? They consummate and detests her. Same wording is the last thing and charges her with shameful conduct and brings a bad name on her and says, I took this woman. And when I came to her, I found she was not a virgin. Do you see, this is a bit more of an explanation as to what it is to find some uncleanness and virginity was something that you preserved until you were married. And that's still what the Bible teaches. It's, it's one of those wonderful privileges and things that you share within the bounds of marriage, not outside the bounds of marriage. And so if you find out that your wife has been sleeping with somebody else and you just got married to her, then there's a way for you to get out of this. And you've been deceived. You've been roped into this thing. In fact, probably the laws that have come into place that we understand, like just basically erasing your marriage like it never happened, um, probably have their roots here. But this is, a very, this is a very certain circumstance. It's sexual immorality before the marriage. I wonder how many of us would still be married if, if you said, hey, have you ever been sexually intimate with another man? I know I'd be disqualified from getting married. So it's very particular, right? A divorce is only under this circumstance, right? just so that you understand the background of this. But you have to be careful if you're a man and just got married and you find some uncleanness in her and you decide you're going to process this and go forward. It's not just write her a piece of paper and she's out the door. This goes to court. Later on in Deuteronomy 22, 16 and 19, it explains, and the young, young woman's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man as a wife and he detests her. Now he has charged her with shameful conduct, saying, I found your daughter was not a virgin, and yet these are the evidences of my daughter's virginity. This is where they would take the bed sheets and present them as... Never mind. And these are the evidences of my daughter's virginity, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of that city shall take that man and punish him. And they shall fine him 100 shekels of silver and give, him to the and give it to the father of the young woman because he has brought a bad name on the virgin of Israel and she shall be his wife. He cannot divorce her all his days. So if you're going to bring a charge like that and you get found that you were in error, there's, there is no divorce. You can't get divorce. It's like, forget it. You, you tried to kick her out the door. You had your way, so to speak. And now you want to just dismiss her and start over fresh. That doesn't happen. Especially if she's found true, you're married, pal, and you will never divorce her, period. That's the law. So you see, this is what the whole rest of the Old Testament teaches about marriage and divorce. It's a permanent contract. It's a covenant before God. So it's not something easily... Like these guys in the New Testament, the Pharisees are saying, yeah, Moses gave us a commandment. We should divorce our wives. No, that's not the way it is. He says, if you're going to do that, this needs to be observed because you can't just treat women like that. Isn't that interesting? You can't do that in the Muslim community. Muhammad married, was engaged to a girl who was six years old and he consummated when she was nine and he was in his 40s. We have a word for that. So you see, the Bible, although written before the Quran, teaches dignity in marriage and dignity with women. 
You guys see that? I hope you do. Now, if you want to be further stupefied at what the Old Testament says about divorce, here's one. And people love to twist this into what they want it to be. Uh, Exodus 21, 7 to 11. And if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since, she, since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. If he does not do these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. How many of you have never seen this passage? Okay, a few more people. What in the stinking world is going on here? By the way, slavery in the scriptures is more like employment. It's more like conscription. You, to pay off a debt, you offer your services to pay off a debt. That sounds a lot like a job. That's how I pay my mortgage. You offer your services indentured, and it's a six-year term, and on the seventh year, you're free. So when you make that arrangement, uh, you better get paid off in six years, because on the seventh year, you're done. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be good to have a mortgage that only lasted seven years? Or, well, car payments are getting up there. But anyway, <laughs> I've never had one. I'm grateful. But this is what the Bible teaches. If you're going to take somebody on and they're going to pay off a debt and you say, listen, here's my daughter. Maybe you find her interesting uh, as she's serving. Maybe you want to get married to her at some point in time. And so she'll serve in your house. She'll, she'll get you food. She'll cook for you and clean and, you know, do whatever you want to. And if you decide that she's a, you know, a good looking girl and you want to marry her and she's, she would be a good wife, well, then you can go ahead and do that. But then it's no longer a, a work for money situation, is it? She's now family and you can't treat her like a slave. You have to treat her like a daughter. And that stopped people from saying, yeah, 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 come into my house. And then they, they marry somebody like that and then they treat them like dirt and they treat them like a slave. The Bible says you, you need to treat that woman like your wife because she's your wife. And you need to treat her like a daughter. Now, if you're not interested, maybe your son is because of the age. And so if your son's interested in marrying her, then that's fine. He can marry her. But if he marries another woman, now polygamy was something that they did back then. It was a cultural thing, not a biblical thing. If he gets married to another woman and he begins to shortchange his first wife with three things, food, clothing, or marital rights, by the way, that's uh, conjugal visits, that's intimacy, physical intimacy. If you get shortchanged by those things, she has the right to leave her husband because she's not being treated as a wife any longer. And he's got another wife. So unless you are A, a Hebrew, B, have hired somebody for an a period of time and then decided to marry them and there's money involved and there's polygamy happening, this verse won't apply to anyone here in America. Amen. You get that? It has to meet that requirement. If it doesn't, then you're just twisting it to mean whatever the heck it is you want. Oh, yeah, well, Moses said you could get divorced if, you know, if she feels she's being unfairly treated. Well, are you getting food? Well, yes. You have clothing? Well, yes. You still having sex? No, because I told him no. Oh, well, that's not a reason to get divorced. And it's certainly not a reason to withdraw. Anyway, I might be a little sensitive, so forgive me. Among the Jews of that day, marriage was a sacred duty. If a man was unmarried after the age of 20, which is most people today, except to concentrate on the study of the law, which is the scriptures, he was guilty of breaking God's command to be fruitful and multiply. According to Barclay, uh, a commentator, they said that by not having children, he killed his own descendants. 
and he has lessened the glory of God on earth. This, the Judaic, the Judea ethic is to value life, is to value marriage and children. That's the norm. That's the thing that's elevated because the Lord did say, be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say add. Multiplication is a bit different. And he said, subdue the earth, rule it, run it. You need people for that. So waiting until your 40s to have kids might be something you're forced into doing, but it wasn't so in the first century. So in the context of everything that we're going over here, this is the mindset of most of the Jews in that territory. And you still find it in the Jewish community today where they have lots and lots of kids. You guys aware of that? Our, the United States has gone to the level where there are more people dying than being born. You know what that's going to do? Any of you young people plan on getting Social Security? <laughs> you see, when you have several million people chipping into something and you're only, you're doing much less, you're having to put out much less, then that leaves you with a surplus. But if you don't have as many people putting in as you have taking out, it's called bankruptcy. So because we don't value marriage and because we don't value children, our nation is dying. I read an article that was written in 1947 about how our society cannot sustain 25% divorce because it just destroys the family. And anyway, I, I talk too much. <laughs> marriage is to be valued and is to be preserved and not treated with disregard like our society treats it. Verse five, and Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. He's saying, listen, yeah, later on, all this was going on, but you guys don't look at the 99%. Let's go back to the beginning. God created man and, and woman, male and female. What did he make man out of? Dust and breath. What did he make the woman from? The man. So there's a connection there. Men, we have a connection to the earth, right? With dirt. It's, we play in the dirt as we, we work. Work the ground, get dirty. That's right. Women are very attached to their husbands. Their, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. So there's a whole... Interesting thing. Forgive me, guys. I'm trying to make this fast. I really am. Jesus answered and said, because of the hardness of your heart, divorce then is a recognition of sinful hearts on either side that cannot or will not be forgiving and gracious. Divorce happens when somebody decides to not forgive or be gracious. That is the majority of what happens with divorce. You just get sick and tired of forgiving. Marriage takes two good forgivers, if that's a real word. In Malachi 2, 13 to 16, this is God's point of view on this. And this is the second thing that you do. These are accusations against the people of God who were called the bride of Christ. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping and crying. And so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? They were making sacrifice and they felt God was not listening. Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously or recklessly. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But he did not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit. And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Men, when I read that, I take that as a warning to me to be careful I treat 
the Lord's daughter well, because I don't want to make her father angry, who happens to be my father. God hates divorce. Does he hate divorced people, though? He loves people. He loves people. Think about it. The woman at the well. He said, hey, how you doing? Could you get me a drink? And she goes, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan woman. You're a Jewish man. This is not right. And he says, well, if you knew who it was who asked you for a drink, you'd ask him for living water and he'd give it to you. And it would become the spring of water welling up inside of you into eternal life. Well, you don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get that kind of water? And she says, you know, I wish you'd give me this water so I don't have to keep coming here to drink. And he goes, well, go get your husband. We'll have a conversation. And she goes, oh, I, I, uh, I don't have a husband. He goes, you're right. You've had five. And the man you're living with now, he's not your husband either. So you're right. You're not married. And she goes, I perceive that you are a prophet. Yeah, no mystery there. Begins to ask him some religious questions. You know, you guys, you worship in Jerusalem, but we worship on this mountain. He goes, you know, the time has come when the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit and truth. It's not about your geography. It's about your heart condition. And she drops her bucket and she runs off and she tells the men of the city, come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Does Jesus have a problem with her? He loved her. In fact, he said, I got to go to Samaria, to Samaria. And the disciples went, what? That's like wandering through Harlem at midnight. What are you doing? Or Newark. Jesus said, I got an appointment. And then he sent them all away and he had a conversation with this woman. He deliberately spent time with her alone. As th so the disciples wouldn't browbeat her probably. I think of the woman that was thrown down at his feet, who the, the, the Pharisee said, this woman was just caught in the very act of adultery. Moses says we should stone her. What do you say? And Jesus doodled in the ground. And he says, you are without sin. Here, cast the first stone. And it says, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, they all dropped their stones and they walked away until it was just Jesus and this woman. And Jesus looks up from his little doodling in the dirt and he goes, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, Lord, there are none. And he said, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Does Jesus love people who are adulterers and divorced? You're darn right he does. I just wanted to let you understand the heart of Jesus when we're going through all of this. Because if you've been through a divorce, you might be under a heavy load of conviction right now. Like, Oh my goodness, I can't believe this. But Jesus loves people, and it's not the unforgivable sin. I'll get letters about that later. <laughs> Jesus, in arguing with them, goes all the way back to the beginning, and he's saying God's original intention is for one man and one woman forever. Permanent. No matter what. In fact, when you say vows, right? That's what you say. For rich or poor and sickness and health till death do us part with in-laws and outlaws and children. Oh my, we will get through it. Right? That th those, those are like your typical, you might've had some other kind of vow, but you committed to do those things. And God heard, he holds you to do that. that would, that's what Jesus does. In arguing about what it is, you have to know it's a three-legged race. Right? Those of you who are married know what I'm talking about. It's a three-legged race. There's got to be some cooperation, right? You, there's got to be somebody stepping off and saying, you know, left, right, left. No, 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 you're left. <laughs> so that you can do that. In the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Two Different people, but he calls them one. Different, but one. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? It's like an oxymoron. My wife is different from me, but we're one. Just like Christ and the Father are one. And yet they're different. See a parallel? 
That's why marriage is so close to God's heart, because you will not see anything as a clearer picture of who God is. If you remember, he created them male and female, and he created them in his image, male and female, he created them, which means there's something about male and female, which is the creation of God, which is in his image. His image is more clearly seen in male and female, because men, we're not all there. He caused a deep sleep to, call, to, to fall on Adam, and he took what, his side, actually. It, it's interpreted a rib. You know, God, God's not into ribs. But he took a side of Adam, his feminine side, and he made a woman. And then he saw her and he said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I'll call her woman because she was taken from a man. That's what God's design was from the very beginning. And so the image of God is now incomplete in a man alone because there's a woman that completes him to be more the image of God. It is a fuller picture of the image of God. I'll probably get letters about that too, whatever. <laughs> it's not independence. And it's one of the hardest things when you get married. You're no longer a free, you know, free agent. You can go where you want, do what you want. You're not independent any longer. But it's also not codependence. Codependence is, I can't live without you, I need you, and if you, if you leave me for more than 6.5 hours, I'll kill myself. That's codependence. That's, that's an unusual attachment that should not be there. That's called idolatry in the scriptures. But interdependence, which means I depend upon my wife to do certain things, she depends upon me to do certain things. It's not like um, I'm codependent, which means that things are out of priority. There are people that use words like egalitarian or complementarian. We'll let you guys, if you want to argue about that, talk to Sean. Sean will, will go through that with you. Egalitarian is male and female are exactly equal in every way, and they should have no differences in their jobs, no differences in their allocations in the home, which I don't believe. You know, I don't make my wife cut the lawn, especially when it's this high. I just don't do that. Uh, I don't put things on her that she can't that you can't do. Because no, it's not equal. Okay, you need to make as much as me and pay the bills. I don't do that. A, a true egalitarian would do that. But a complementarian means God has created me for certain things and I'm responsible for that and I better do it. And I don't have a problem crossing the aisle and doing stuff that she does, but I know what my priorities are. Okay? So that's complementarianism. Why? Marriage was created by God for wholeness and holiness. Men, you guys know that you're unbalanced? <laughs> Don't make me come down there. <laughs> yeah, you're imbalanced. Just, I, but when I met my wife, I was big on truth and very shy on love. Oh, wow, you're crying. What's wrong with you? Let me, let me fix your problem. These are three steps. I had, I had very little compassion. I was very shallow on that end of the pool. But my wife, whom I met, is very deep in love. In fact, maybe more than it should be. But she was very deep in love. And so I learned to be loving because I saw the image of God in my wife. She learned to be truthful and tell the truth, even if it hurts, from me. And so we polish each other off. Because without her, I'm not whole. I'm not complete, and I have a lot to learn, and I've learned a lot from my wife. God's number one tool in my life. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that kind of marriage is the kind of marriage you have, where you learn from each other, you polish each other, you polish each other's rough edges off, because God's intention for marriage is wholeness in our lives and holiness unto God. It's not just reproduction filling the earth or else <laughs> why would we be married any longer? We're done with that. Wholeness and holiness. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife or cleave into his wife, if you like the King James. And the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. God joins people together. Scripture says God joins people together. A marriage is two people saying God is joining us together. That's the most important thing. Everything else you can work out, right? 
as long as I know that the Lord wants me married to this woman, I will tough it out and do whatever I have to do. And she's made the same commitment. Whatever it is, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. It's not like, well, you burned my dinner. I'm done with you. <laughs> That's baloney. What kind of love is that? And especially if it's supposed to be the picture of the, the love that Christ has for the church. How, how, can you, how can you see that with that kind of thing? So we don't tamper with God's work, right? We help it along. Now, this is Jesus assuring us that the original paradigm is what Jesus believes marriage is from God. You leave. Uh, the, the order for the two people to leave is probably more applicable to younger people, but you leave your parents, right? When you get married, you start your own house. How much trouble it is, it, is it for a husband and a wife to move into the parents' house? Oh, there's trouble. <laughs> trouble right here in River, River City. Yeah, because we've done this, okay? So we know what it's like. And there's always friction and there's authoritative arm wrestling things that happen, right? Where the parents will buy a house, but they have a thousand strings attached to it, and it happens to be right next to theirs. <laughs> you got to cut those strings, and they have to be allowed to be independent, parents. And boys and girls, when you get married, make sure you separate, because your parents will get in, and if you get a controlling person, they'll try to control you and tell you what you will do and when you will do it. And <laughs> My mother-in-law used to come over and knock on our door. Sometimes, sometimes she would just use her key and walk right in when I was newly married on a Saturday morning. And we weren't dressed. We were enjoying fellowship. And all of a sudden, you hear the door close and you go, wait, wait, did you hear that? No, I didn't hear anything. Don't worry about it. No, no, wait a minute. And then you hear footsteps walking through the hall, and you're like, she's coming in. There needs to be a leaving. There needs to be privacy. There needs to be the development of a new paradigm. If you don't have that, you're going to have lots of trouble. Trust me, I won't tell you the rest of the story. You have to leave, and sometimes that's a distance. Sometimes that's privacy. You have to cleave, which is the old word, which means they were joined together, which means to hold and pursue with vigor and energy. And by the way, you'll notice that the onus is on the man to do that. The man is to pursue his wife, not to the point of marriage and then just become the king of the remote. <laughs> it means you invest in that relationship. You chase that woman like you were dating. Dating doesn't stop once you get married. That's what that means. Are you guys picking up what I'm laying down there? Yes. Yeah. I date my wife every Friday night, and I'll take her out to dinner whether I believe she needs it or not. Because <laughs> that's her love language. And you know what? I, I can't always afford it, or I don't think I can always afford it, but I have been able to do it for years and years and years. And it's the time when we argue. It's the time when we resolve conflicts. It's the time when we set our schedules. It's the time when we digest things that have gone on in our lives. I need to pursue my wife because it's like a garden. You just don't throw seeds out and say, look, I got a garden. <laughs> no, you need to tend it. You need to weed it. You need to fertilize it. You need to water it. You need to make sure you put a fence around it and the birds don't eat it before you get to it. There's a lot of work that goes into a garden. How much more a marriage? So what you do is you leave your mother and father, you cleave, you pursue with energy and effort, and you hold, hold, and you become one flesh. This is not just the sexual union, although it includes that. It means there's no me and you anymore. There's us, ours. You know, there's my debt, and then there's your debt. <laughs> no, it's our debt. It's our debt. And there's your bank account and my bank account. No, there's our bank account. Your children. No, no, no. They're our children. <laughs> Under our roof. It's ours. Everything is ours. You have to stop saying mine, yours. Well, that's your problem. No, no. It's my problem. 
because it's our problem. That's what marriage is, and you have to, it's a really difficult flip to think about me, 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 mine, 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 and then think ours. It's an interesting shift in gears. So single people, unless you're ready to say ours with that guy or with that girl, don't marry him because you're going to get it all. And the fourth one that Jesus didn't mention in here because he didn't continue on is that they were both naked and ashamed, unashamed. They were naked and unashamed. What does that mean? That means there's an atmosphere of complete openness and honesty and complete disclosure. That's what that means. 100% access to each other, 100% disclosure, no secrets. Right? Okay. You guys got all quiet. I see we're out of time. Okay. <laughs> the Spirit of God goes, Dave, you went on too long. And I'm like, okay, should I beat myself up? No, no, it's okay. Just move on. Okay. It took me a second. I'd like to uh, ask the worship team to come up. As we talk about marriage and divorce, you can't just look at divorce itself. You have to look at marriage and understand what the scripture teaches about marriage, what God's intention is, what his plans were, because you can't really talk about divorce until you understand fully the way God sees marriage. And I think people who are looking to get out of a relationship that may have run out of opportunities or run out of choices to resolve their issues, I just don't think they're trying hard enough. If you're struggling in your marriage, I want to talk with you. If you've got an issue that you need to deal with, sometimes you have to get a third party involved. But divorce isn't the way. Because what happens when you make a divorce? You go back on everything you committed. I'm not sure that I'd, I don't know how long it would take me to survive a divorce. And I feel incredibly compassionate towards anybody that goes through a divorce because it will rip your insides up. It's not an answer. Very often it's an avoidance and it's sin. There are some certain loopholes in which God has said in these cases, it's acceptable, but it's not preferable. And we'll talk about that next week. Mm -hmm.